Welcome to Unpacking the Athlete Podcast, hosted by yours truly, Rob Martin. Welcome to Unpacking the Athlete, a podcast dedicated to diving deep into what makes athletes who they are. Today's guest has made a career out of mountain biking. Here is a list of his top career accomplishments. In 1996, he was the collegiate national mountain bike champion. In 2004, 2008, and in 2012, he was on the U.S. mountain bike Olympic team. And in 2010, he won the XC, ST, XC, and CX national championships all in the same year. When I started on the bike, he was someone I looked up to. Our guest today is Todd Wells. Welcome, Todd. Let's get going. Thanks for having me. Anytime. If there was one sport you wished you would or could have excelled at other than being on the bike, what would it have been and why? Well, I'll have two in here. Okay. Because the the first sport... When I, when I was growing up, I always wanted to be a professional BMX racer. And from the time I was about five or six until I was 16 or 17, BMX was my life. And that was pretty much all I did. Rode every day, had trails, little track in my backyard, and would just do it nonstop. Loved the sport. But I was never very good at it. I, I got like where I would race some nationals, but if I made the main, it'd get lucky because someone would have crashed in the semi. And then in the main, maybe I'd get six because a couple of people had crashed in the main. But I was never up there really fighting for the win. And I was never going to be a, a pro BMXer. So when I first started mountain biking, I had had thought that I would be a dual slalom racer since a lot of the top BMX guys at that time, Eric Carter, Mike King, Brian Lopes, they were all transitioning. They were great BMXers, pro BMXers, awesome, top of their game. They were all transitioning into the mountain bike and having this great success in the dual slalom. And so where I grew up, we didn't really have a lot of dual slalom happening. We had a few kids rode mountain bikes and we had some cross country trails and within probably a month or two, maybe, maybe a little bit longer. I was better on the mountain bike after a few months and I had been doing BMX for 10 years of my life. So anyway, I always had had wanted to be a BMX racer growing up. And now that I've, I've been a professional mountain biker, got to live out that dream. If I could do another sport, it would probably be golf. I didn't play golf when I was a kid. I picked it up in college and I always felt like it was a nice complement to mountain bike racing and, and cycling, cycling so intense, so physical and golf. You had to be ultra focused for a couple seconds when you're hitting your shot. And then you had to be able to switch off and be casual and, you know, just kind of go about, go about talking hanging out with whoever you're playing with and then you had to get over your shot you had to hyper focus again and so i just thought that was really cool and a really cool mix compared to cycling so how many golf rounds do you play a year (laughs) well it's funny i always had aspirations when i had retired from cycling to take a year off and just play golf as much as i could and just see how how much i could improve and Since I've stopped cycling, I now have less time to play golf and end up playing less golf than when I was a bike racer. Because with cycling, you have times or mountain biking where you're gone for weeks or months at a time, but then you have time when you're at home and you're there training. And if you're doing these big training blocks, then a lot of times you're too tired to play. But there are other times when you're resting or taking it easy that you, you know, you don't have to go to work. So you have all day to essentially play. So I'd have these like little bursts of time where I'd play every day for a couple weeks and then I wouldn't play for a few months. And now I'd probably play, I don't know, once or twice a week if it's a, if it's a good week and maybe get up, get up to the range and hit some balls one or two times. So do you have a favorite course? I don't have a favorite course. We have a few courses here in Durango. Durango um, is where I live and it's a pretty small town. But we have one public, one semi-private, one private course here in town, and another public course down in New Mexico, which is about an hour away, which is one of the actually the top-ranked 
courses in New Mexico, public courses called Pinion Hills. So most of the time I play here at Hillcrest. Sometimes I play at this semi-private course called Dalton. And then occasionally I'll be able to play up at the Glacier Club. But as far as favorite course, I would, I'm going to say Star Pass in Tucson, Arizona. I would spend the winters down there when I was training a lot. And I still go down there for the winter when I can. My parents go there in the winter. And so it's a, it's a nice golf course right in the little community where we stay. Something about desert golf, the Saguaros, the Target, I don't know, the, the contrast between the green fairways and everything else, just I really like that. So if anyone's visiting that area, there's a golf course. As long, it's a public one, right? Yep. Yep, so they can hit that golf course up. Good recommendation. And there's good mountain bike trails there, too, so you can kill two birds with one stone. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Bring your bike, too. I'm going to change gears a little bit. In 1996, I graduated high school, and you were racing for a national title in college. Can you take us back to that experience and tell us how the race went, who was there, and did you expect to win that race? Sure. And I think it was 96. It may have even been 95. I can't remember exactly because I graduated high school in 94. And okay. that collegiate, that specific championships may have been 95, but it's 95, 96, one of those years. And no, I, I didn't really expect to win. We had the collegiate mountain bike champs here in Durango that year. They've been in Durango one other time since then. And it was last year. They have them again this year. But it was pretty unique because the race was held on the campus in Durango at Fort Lewis. And there's some trail systems that kind of work around the campus called the Horse Gulch Trail Systems. But we started on campus and we went into Horse Gulch. At the time, Durango was probably about half the size as it is today. I think there's maybe 50 or 60,000 people that live in the county. So we were maybe 30,000 people then. And the town, I don't know, maybe 10,000 people or... Maybe less, but anyway, of those people, all the most of the top pros at that time all lived in town. We had John Tomac lived here, Greg Herbold, Miles Rockwell, Missy Giovi, Julie Furtado. These are all kind of the pioneers of the sport. And when the sport started, the U.S. dominated the international scene. And for a long time, until just recently, we had kind of struggled on the international scene. We had Chris Blevins win the world champ, short track champs last year, and a World Cup. Before that, I think Tinker may have been the last person to win a World Cup back around 2000, early 2000, late 90s. So it was pretty cool. All those top pros were there at the race. And Durango is a big cycling town as well. They had the first mountain bike world championships in 1990 the uci mountain bike championships were held here in town so the town has a, a big cycling history it's a small town with a big cycling history with a lot of top athletes that live here and coming out here to school for me i i grew up in kingston new york it's a fairly small rural area in the hudson valley in between new york city and albany and we there were some people that rode bikes but most you know it wasn't really a cycling mecca like Durango. If you would see someone with a bike rack on their car, you would flag them down so you could ride with them. And in Durango, it's more likely to see, a, or it's more unlikely to see a car without a bike rack on it. <laughs> so anyway, it's a, it's a big cycling town. So there were tons of people there. And coming into the race, I'd been racing with the college that fall and had some good results. And we had a home course advantage where we got to design the course. I remember our coach at the time, Keith Darner, who he has since put on, he puts on some enduro races, some other races in the Southwest area. But he designed this course that had this giant hike a bike that nobody except our team knew about. So it was probably like a three or four minute hike a bike up this rocky ridge. So we had some little advantages like that. We'd ridden the course a, a ton of times. And at that time, the courses were longer. They were 30 or 40 minute laps, whereas today's cross country loops are, you know, 10 to 15 minutes. So knowing the course was a big advantage. And I thought I had a, a decent shot of, you know, getting in the top five, top 10. But I actually went out and won the race. 
I, I knew how I stacked up against our, our local competition or our regional competition because collegiate cycling at that time, we probably did three or four races before the national championships. And we just, we, the furthest we would drive was maybe seven or eight hours. So we, we'd kind of hit our region, but I had no idea Cal Poly had won the first collegiate mountain bike national championships, which had happened the prior year. So I had no, no idea how those guys would go or the East Coast people or anybody, but um, it was amazing because I, I won that race and I had won some local races back in New York, but I hadn't been to many big races. I think I went to Mount Snow that year and raced the Norba National there before I came out to college in Durango, but I had a mechanical and I just, it, it wasn't a great race for me. And I, I certainly wasn't leading when I had the problems. I was, you know, mid-pack at best. So it was a huge jump for me to win that race. And it really helped jumpstart my career. I had met a lot of the pros at that time in town and Ned Overin, I'd become friends with him. And, you know, it's a small town. We have group rides. We ride together on Tuesday nights and race each other. So I got to know a lot of the guys and he was really instrumental in helping me get started with Specialized at, at that time after I had won that race. So it really kind of jumpstarted my whole career. Yeah, that's one of those overnight kind of things right went in a race like that yeah it was i mean like i said it was amazing i had won some local races and made like a 100 bucks in a weekend that i thought was awesome but i had never really won a big race so it was really cool how about the olympics what year was your favorite year and why i went to athens beijing and london and they're all special you know athens was really cool because it was the first time i had went to the olympics and growing up as a kid racing BMX, at that time, BMX wasn't in the Olympics, and I wasn't very good at it. So becoming an Olympian never was really on my radar. We would watch it at TV as a, on TV as a family, mostly the Winter Olympics, because in the summer, it seemed like we were always out doing stuff. But to, to be able to become an Olympian, to go to the birthplace of the Olympics in Athens for my first Olympics... And to have such an arduous qualification process that year was really cool. They actually made a little movie about it, Off-Road to Athens, where they followed, I think there were maybe six or seven guys and maybe five or six ladies that were all trying to make the team. And they followed us around to all these different races. At the time, it was the probably the main qualification because none of us were, none of the guys, some of the girls were winning World Cups. But the guys, it was um, gathering UCI points. So who could stockpile the most UCI points in a allotted amount of time? And so there's a certain number of different category races that you can apply towards your UCI point total. So maybe there's different categories. There's World Cups. There's continental championships. There's national championships. There's C1, C2s, like all these different types of races. And so if you could take six C1 races and there's no, there are no C1 races in the U.S., but there are a bunch in Europe or in Central America or wherever, then you could fly off to these places and try to get these points when you're hoping some of the other guys either aren't going to those races or you're going to do better than them at the races. But so anyway, we flew around the world so much that year and just the, the journey to try to make the team was so intense that making it was amazing. And for everybody going for it on the men's side, it was all of our, I believe it was all our first time trying to make the team. It was such a battle for all of us. And it wasn't the best prep for the Olympics because by the time we got there, we were all pretty much smashed. <laughs> but to be part of that process and then to have it work out where I actually made the team was really cool. I didn't have the best result there. I was okay, like maybe 19 or something, which back in 2004, 19, anywhere from top 10 to top 20 was pretty good for a U.S. rider at that time. We had kind of fallen off from Tomac and Ned and Tinker winning those World Cups, and we hadn't quite gotten to where Chris Blevins and Riley and Howard Grotz are up there also fighting for podiums. So it was okay. But then in London, I had my best result. I was 10. Again, not, not 
not a medal, obviously, but for me personally, it was a great result. And it's funny, the first time I was kind of overwhelmed and just in awe of the whole experience. The second time I had hoped to do well and had a horrible race. But this third time, it kind of all came together for me. We had some great training camp leading into the race with the U.S. team. And then I stayed with my trade team in London, not in the Olympic Village, because the Olympic Village was a over an hour from the venue. So we stayed right next to the venue. And I don't know, it all clicked. It was it was great. I had even ridden as high as sixth place, I think, in that race and could see the leaders on some of the climbs midway through the through the event. So I mean that was just having a, a medal within sight halfway through was was pretty awesome. Obviously a long way from the finish, but in mountain bike races, as most mountain bike racers know, you take off at the start. And in a shorter cross-country style race, if, if you're in 30th at the start, it, it's going to be hard to move much from 30th. You're likely not going to go from 30th to, to 5th or 1st, unless maybe you're Tom Pickcock or some, you know, just some just anomaly. But for the, for the average, you know, pro racer out there, you're kind of, you kind of, end up where you kind of start and especially at that time world cups had tons of racers there were sometimes 200 racers lining up olympics there's always fit, been 50 men but world cups where we're racing all the time sometimes there's 200 riders so if you start in 50th or 60th just to hold that position is you know against the best in the world is something so anyway it was a it was an amazing amazing race for me i was super happy with it and that was probably my you know my favorite olympics i can see why and you're right when i watch world cups today if you're even above 30 and you get into a section of the course where it bottlenecks there's really nothing you can do you get stuck they're off the bike they're walking and the leaders are continuing to press at race pace while you're walking and stuck in this line going really slow <laughs> exactly. And those guys are up there on the front row for a reason because they're the best guys out there. So if if you're not the best guy and you give the best guy, you know, 30 seconds or a minute, unless you're having an amazing day, that's not not coming back. <laughs> right. <laughs> Speaking of XC, can you explain to people what XC stands for and maybe a little bit about that type of race for people that don't understand maybe the abbreviation and what the race is? XC stands for cross country in mountain biking and the mountain bike cross country courses, distance, the discipline has evolved a lot over the years. When mountain biking started back in the later 80s, early 90s, the cross country courses were typically at ski areas, although we did have one in Traverse City. They were typically at ski areas and you typically climb to the top of a ski area and descend down. So they were long, sustained 10, 20, 30 minute climbs. And then same with the descents. There were long descents. There were probably, you know, 10 minute descents, 15 minute descents. And you do multiple laps. They would, I think they would shoot for two or two and a half hours for the winning time. So oh. if you have a two hour winning time on a 40 or 50 minute lap, you could have people coming in around three hours, which is when I started first racing World Cups, that's I felt like I'd be between that two and a half and three hour range for those first races. And the courses have since evolved um, to make the sport more exciting, to make it easier to film. Obviously, it's hard to film a, a 40 minute lap with 10 stationary cameras. So the courses over time have become shorter, anywhere from 10 to 15 minute laps for the World Cups and Olympics and that style of racing. And they feature a lot of technical sections and shorter climbs and descents. So because the laps are shorter, obviously you're going to have less sustained climbing and descending. But they also have gone away from the one long climb, one long descent, and they've they've broken it up. So maybe there are three or four climbs and three or four little descents per lap. So, it, you know, it's become much more explosive. It's kept the races much tighter because in general, it's easier for someone to hang on for a two minute climb and then a 40 second descent than it is if, if you're climbing against a great climber and you're going uphill for 30 minutes, likely the gap's going to be bigger. 
anyway, that uh, an XC course or cross country course is now 10 to 15 minute laps and they shoot to keep the lap times around an hour or the winning time around an hour and 15 minutes, I think. So it's gotten much tighter. Uh, the racing has become more exciting and the riders have become better. The equipment has become better. So this, the stuff that these guys and girls can ride and the speed at which they ride, it is just incredible. It is good explanation. <laughs> Can you explain to people now what STXC stands for and a, a little bit about what that type of race is? STXC is a short track, and this is a, a shorter race than across country. And the short track started here in the U.S. I'd say in the early 2000s, maybe maybe mid to maybe 2005, between 2005 2010, and they just incorporated it into the World Cups as well a couple of years ago. But a, a short track, the races are typically around 20 minutes, 20 to 25 minutes, and the laps are anywhere from two to three minutes long. So it's it's kind of like a criterium on the mountain bike. And these courses are typically flatter, and it's more group racing, so there are more tactics, kind of like you would see in a road race, where there's some drafting involved because the speeds are typically higher, the terrain is flatter, and it's a shorter duration event. So a lot of it comes down to a group racing in the finish and tactically when you want to try to go or attack or get a gap on everybody else. And the World Cup does a great job covering this as well. You can really see the, the different dynamics and how, you know, if someone mistimes it, they might be the strongest rider in the race, but it, it's all about timing because if they wait too long or they try to to go too soon then typically a, another rider will win so it, it's a really exciting race and it's it's a cool addition to you know the cross country it's definitely exciting <laughs> watching yeah. and, and all efforts that go in that like you said pidcock's a good one and vanderpool is another good one those guys can just blast out the power and sometimes get away from the whole pack even in those short races which is pretty crazy in my mind when I watch it. Yeah, I mean, what, watching those guys and what they're able to do against the best riders in the world <laughs> is just insane. It's um, a whole nother level. And the riders you see in those World Cups that are on TV, that's their life. You know, they, they live and breathe that every day. They train for it all day long. That's all they do. And the fact that we can have those riders that are so much better than these other riders that are also amazing is just it's, it's it's an exciting time to be a fan of of cycling it sure is now maybe can you talk about cx and then what that stands for and what you may encounter during a race like that cx is stands for cyclocross and cyclocross has been around for a long time it it predated mountain biking and it started as a way for road cyclists and road cycling was bigger in Europe than it was in the U S. So it started as a way for road cyclists to train in the winter and cyclocross is typically a, I don't know, I want to say a seven to 10 minute lap. And it's typically in a park like setting. So it's rolling terrain and the cyclocross season has gotten earlier recently, but typically it would be in the fall and the winter. So it'd be bad weather. And a lot of times it'd be muddy or raining. Cyclocross is really big in Europe and Belgium and Holland and those places get a lot of rain. So it's typically boggy and slow. There, there are sections where they have barriers which are like planks that stick up that force you to get off your bike and run. Although now most people can bunny hop them. They'll have long stair sections and twisty turns and, and you race cyclocross on a bike that is more like a road bike than a mountain bike. So it's, it's kind of like a road bike with mountain bike tires. And it's just a very awkward sport. It's if you try to like take the least capable bike and go do these tricky off camber tight corners in the mud, that is essentially cyclocross. And when you watch people that do it well, it looks somewhat easy most of the time, um, not all the time. But if you go out there and try to emulate what they're doing, it's just uh, it's crazy 
how how good these riders are and what they can do. But anyway, cyclocross is typically about an hour long, and it's a cross country has gotten more like cyclocross over the years, where the distance is shorter and it's become much more explosive. Cyclocross, you're constantly accelerating, decelerating, jumping on your bike, jumping off your bike. It's it's a lot of technique and it's a lot of VO2 and just really high end efforts. Cyclocross, it seems like your if you look at your power file or your heart rate or whatever chart you use to track your your activity, you might have a similar threshold number for the whole race, but your time actually at that threshold is, you know, just about never. You're always above or below it. You're you're coasting into a corner for three seconds or four seconds going around it, and then you're sprinting out of it as hard as you can for a couple seconds, then you're jumping off your bike and you're back on and just I don't know, it's it's a really cool sport. They often describe it as the steeple chase of cycling. But it's um it's a great way to stay fit in the winter and actually build fitness for your for your spring. Yeah, I kind of feel like they're almost like a it's almost like a really hard interval workout to me. Just like you said, it's you got to slow for the corner so you're not going and then you come around a corner, it's all out sprint to the next corner and you're, you know, it just it just seems like nonstop intervals whenever I've done a CX race. <laughs> Yes, it's very painful. It's like this. It's like doing the very start of the race for the whole race. Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, that's enough. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so in 2010, you won the national championships for all those disciplines. That's pretty crazy to think of to winning all those, and and they're all kind of different, which makes it even more interesting. So out of those three races. Which result was the hardest or maybe which surprised you the most? That's a good question. I would say, well, they were all hard. Mountain bike, throughout my career, I always raced cyclocross, but it was never my focus. I would focus on the national championships, but my focus was always on the mountain bike. So I'd kind of drop into the cyclocross season a little bit later because I would take a break after the mountain bike season ended, which was typically in September. And our national championships for cyclocross, they're back in December now. They had switched to January for a while. When, when I raced it, the majority of the time, they were in December. So it was a pretty tight turnaround to start racing end of October, beginning of November, and get in you know top form by mid-December. But that was always kind of my target for cyclocross. And so I'd say I was probably most surprised to win the cyclocross championship that year because throughout the years and cyclocross has fallen in popularity some now but 2010 i'd say early 2000s through 2010 2000 even maybe 14 was cyclocross's peak in popularity here in the u.s you know as i see it we didn't have the World Cups like we do now in Waterloo, Arkansas, but those are, are one-off races, and it's amazing to have all those, you know, everybody come for those events. But in the kind of that mid-2010, 2008, we had the USGP, which was a, a national cyclocross series. We had tons of UCI races. We had a lot of big teams stepping in and supporting cyclocross, and so... We had these riders where cyclocross used to be kind of a a fringe or side sport that road cyclists and mountain bikers would do in the winter to stay fit. Now people started focusing on it. So the level started to come up in those races where guys like Jeremy Powers and Tim Johnson and Ryan Trebone and those, those type of guys, that was kind of their main thing. They might race some on the road or some on the mountain bike, but their focus was cyclocross and they really leveled up the U S cyclocross scene. So for me still focusing primarily on the mountain bike, that was, it was pretty cool to be able to step in and win that race. And then the hardest race, the cross country is always so hard to win. It's, it's funny. You can be doing great internationally and you come to back to do these national events and you, you might beat, beat someone in the world cup by 10 or 20 places. And you come back to the U S and you don't have those 
those five or 10 guys you're chasing and the, the 10 or 20 or 30 guys in between you two and you line up on the start line next to each other and you know it just doesn't always translate into domestic results when you do well internationally and i was doing pretty well internationally that year but didn't have the best domestic results and so it, it's always such a battle and any one day championship anything can happen you got to get it all right you got to get your training right you're you can't have any mechanicals you got to be able to sleep the night before you can't get sick leading into it i mean there's so many things that go into it so to have it all come together for that cross country and for all of those races that year through such a long period of time was pretty awesome when you sent that over that's a solid year i didn't realize you won that was the, a good year. <laughs> So crazy to me. <laughs> yeah, it was a good year. Thinking back on maybe the career, did you ever have a race that was really challenging but ended up being fun at the same time? I think all the races are really challenging and <laughs> most of the time fun at the same time. It's funny cycling and especially in you know this cross country endurance. It's a weird kind of fun. It's a it's a different kind of fun than going out there and like nailing some nice downhill line or like ripping a corner grade. It's this, when you're doing it, it's not always the most fun, but afterwards, you know, you get this kind of like euphoric endorphin release and you're like, wow, that was really awesome. Anytime that I was at a, or in the mix at an international, like a world cup level event, whether it's, you know, even just being there for one of six laps at the start or, you know, and being in that front group or within sniffing distance of that front group. It's hard to describe how hard and intense those races are because you, you would think you, you do a race, you always go as hard as you can and you just kind of end up where you end up. But there's something about that, just like that competitiveness over there and the depth of the fields that it it just ups it a whole nother level and to be towards the front of that kind of scrum even if it's just for a little while is always such a cool feeling that makes sense and back to your point about the xc endurance well it, even just xc it there is something weird about it because when you're pushing hard there's a lot of pain <laughs> right yeah lots of pain and how can that how can that be fun but when you're done, there there is something weird that happens, and you're like, "That was fun." I I can't explain it. I know, and there's there's something very cool about being in the moment when you're when you're competitive with whatever group you're racing in, whether you're just racing your buddy out there on your you know your Wednesday night ride or or whatever, or you're racing the Olympics or whatever it is. When you can be in that moment and you're not thinking about anything else. It's it's hard to get that in today's world, at least for me. I always am thinking about work or kids or what I have to do or or all these other things. But when you're in that like kind of painful suffering competition mode, it um I don't know, it seems like you focus in and you block all that other stuff out and it's pretty cool to be able to have the opportunity to do that. You're right. Today's technology world keeps us all glued to something and you can definitely get away in the pain cave. <laughs> yep, you can. You're not thinking about much other than holding the wheel in front of you or trying to stay away from the person chasing you down. It's like that kind of basic fight or flight mentality. It's, it's, it's pretty special. <laughs> it is. You've been on a lot of bikes. So I'd like to know over the years, what has been your favorite mountain bike of all time? Hmm. I'd have to say, well, for one, the bikes have changed a lot since I started mountain biking. They started, I had a 26 rigid bike that would, with rim brakes and, you know, tube tires where I'd spend more time fixing flats and broken spokes than I would riding the bike, it seemed like, when I first got started. And now we have 29er wheels that are tubeless, that we have front and rear suspension, and the bikes are lighter than the old rigid bikes. They have great lockouts, pedal platforms, all this stuff. So the bikes are so capable today compared to 
what I started on. So I'd probably have to say my current bike, just because they continue to get better. Every time I get a new bike, it seems like it's better than the previous bikes that I've ridden. I have a, a new Scott Spark that front and rear suspension that just, you know, when it's, it's locked out, it, it rides like a hardtail. And then it's got the pedal platform where, you know, if you've got some bumpy stuff you're pedaling through, you can use that mode. And then for the downhills or really rough stuff with it completely open. Just amazing. The bikes have become so stiff. Uh, they work so well. The suspension is amazing. The, the tires now, if you have to change a flat, it's like a, it's such a oddity. I mean, you get these plugs where if you, if you cut a mountain bike tire, you have sealing in there, you stick this plug in the tire, just like you would a car tire. And a lot of times you hit it with a CO2 and you're rolling in less than a minute where before you used to have to take your, your wheel out and you got your tube off and maybe your tire has gotten cut because your rim brakes, the wheel got bent and the brake pads rubbed through the sidewall of the tire. And then you're trying to patch it with some energy bar wrappers or of course you can still have that stuff today but it's just far less common so the technology in the bikes has come a long way you pay for it but it's come a long way <laughs> let's rewind even more and talk about when you got started on the bike and how that happened the first bike maybe it was bmx the kids in my neighborhood all rode bikes, probably like most kids, to get around. And I got this little bike when I was probably four or five years old. And I took it out, and we had a little rock wedge in our yard, and I jumped this rock wedge on my – I don't even remember what kind of bike it was. But it was definitely a bmx size bike, and I was probably four or five years old. And it was just – immediately, I just loved it. At the time, there was no internet or anything like that. So we'd go to the store and I'd look at the BMX magazines at the store. We'd go to the bike shop and I'd just, you know, ogle these, these BMX bikes. And a bunch of the kids in our neighborhood, it was pretty rural where I grew up. So there'd be some trails. There, were, there weren't really mountain bikes then or there weren't mountain bikes where I was growing up or we didn't see them. So these BMX bikes, we'd, we'd ride them around like they were mountain bikes to the trails and build jumps. And it, it just seemed like that was all I would do when I was a kid with any free time that I had. And so it was just instant that I, I loved it. I think my brother and I had a little bit of that too, building trails. I mean, hiking trails mostly across the street in the woods. They weren't very many, but we would ride them too and build little jumps. And there was actually... One time my dad had these wood chips delivered to the house <laughs> and we built a little jump off them, right? And he came home from work to show us how you jumped for real. And he came into that way too fast <laughs> and he separated from the bike. The bike went flying. He landed on his back. He hurt himself a little bit and it just, <laughs> the memories of, of, the first things on the bike. It's just interesting. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> Did you have anyone influence you? Did you have an idol that you looked up to? Again, it's funny because at BMX, there were tons of people I looked up to. I looked up to all these pro riders because a, a lot of time I was at the age I was doing it. I feel like you always look up to the, the people you see at, at on TV or BMX wasn't really on TV but I'd see them in the magazines and hang their pictures on the wall, just like all kids did. I don't know what kids do now. I have a kid, but he's not quite old enough to hang stuff yet. There are people I looked up to. And then in mountain biking, when I started to get into mountain biking, when I was kind of getting towards the end of high school, I always looked up to Tomac and Ned and those, those guys. They were the top at that time. They're the pioneers of the sport. Today, it's funny, you look up to someone, you send them a Twitter message or, right. you know, you, 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 they're so accessible and maybe they don't respond to you, but you can reach out to them. At that time, you, I guess you could try to track down their address and send them a letter or something. Um, <laughs> it was just a different time. I definitely looked up to kind of the top riders in the, in the sport. There wasn't one in particular, but just kind of all these people that were doing were able to make a job and a living doing riding bikes, which was something I aspired to do. 
when and what, if you can remember, was your first ever mountain bike race? And can you walk us through the race and how it went? Oh, yeah. My first mountain bike race was this. It was a mountain bike race in New Jersey. I grew up in New York and it was a mountain bike race. Spacing the name of the the trail system in the race. But I'd started riding mountain bikes that summer. I think it was my sophomore year. And like I said, I did some rides and I immediately was much better at mountain biking than I was at BMX. Um, some race in New Jersey. And since I had been an expert BMX racer, I said, well, I'll just race expert mountain bikes. At that time, there were beginner, intermediate, expert, and pro for mountain bikes. So I jumped in. First, we, my friend and I, Ryan Bartell, we drove down there and camped in some tick-infested field in New Jersey, got woken up in the middle of the night because we weren't allowed to camp there. We didn't know. But anyway, I, I did this race and had a rigid bike, and it was really rocky. I think it was Ringwood State Park. And I don't know, I wasn't last in the race, but I wasn't far from last. I took off like it was a BMX race right at the front. And then after, you know, five or 10 minutes, I was right at the back. And I had never, I had been riding these mountain bikes for a few months, but I hadn't been at that sustained pace for, like I said, back then the races were two or three hours. So I finished that race. I think I slept for 16 hours that night. I was totally smashed. But I, I loved it. It was it was so cool and it was fun. It was new. And the sport at that time as well was just getting going. It was like this totally new sport. And I don't want to say it was an extreme sport, but at the time it was a little bit more extreme than your traditional baseball, basketball, football, those type of sports. And we didn't have the X games and people doing triple backflips on motorcycles and you know just all it's it's amazing the level of all of the the alternative sports nowadays so this was like a kind of a cutting edge sport at the time cross-country mountain biking so it was just so cool for me it was it was such a cool sport i like asking people about their first race because most of the time it's not the best experience or best result but yet everyone that I've talked to has stayed with it and gotten a lot better and progressed through the sport. And it's just kind of cool to see where people start and then where people finish. Definitely. How many years did you race at the pro level? I think in 96, I was semi-pro, 97 pro. I raced for a couple of years, quit, took some time off to go to college and then stopped racing in 2017 or 2018. So around 20 years. Okay. And out of take. all those years, what year was your favorite year? Whew, that's a good one. They were all really good years. I mean, anytime you get to do what you love is a good year. But the first year was pretty special becoming a pro the the year before I turned pro they had this category which is gone now called semi pro where it was kind of a transitional category they created to help bridge the gap between amateur and pro and it was more like kind of like a U23 category today so I traveled some with that but my first year as a pro getting to travel all over was really cool my best year was probably 2 maybe 2000 2008 I had finally like a breakout year on the World Cup where I I think I got on the podium. There's a five-person podium in the World Cup, so I was maybe fifth. But I was in the front group of those races. I remember doing this race in Hoofelies, Belgium, which is kind of it's my favorite race. It's kind of a classic World Cup. Belgium is cycling crazy, and there's you know tens of thousands of people stuffed into this little Belgian village with a river running through it and all these old buildings and the, the course kind of loops in and out of the village and you're riding through people's yards or goat paths and you drop down some crazy descent. But anyway, the, I was at that race and I had made it into the lead group. It starts up this really steep climb. If you've ever seen the classic photo from Liège, Bastogne Liège with all the riders going between these like really old houses, buildings up this steep climb, we started up that climb. I believe. And 
at the top of the climb, I had made it into the lead group somehow, which was amazing because usually in those races, if I could just hold my position, I was probably third or fourth row, maybe fifth row. It was a pretty good day for me, but here I was able to actually climb up and bridge to that group and spent a good portion of that race in that lead group. And that was kind of a breakthrough for me to be able to do that in Europe. The U.S. guys, a lot of times we would have pretty good races here in the U.S. The Canadian guys too would be good in Canada and the U.S. But to perform well in Europe is always like that's kind of the ultimate. And so that 2008 year, it started off with that race in Hoofleys. And it just, you know, I had some other great World Cups that year. And so that was probably my best year. When I sit at home and I watch World Cups and there's an American that's toward the front of the race, I, it's so exciting. So <laughs> I can't imagine being that American and, and progressing through that year and just being there and being at that level. It's just, it, that'd be awesome. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was so cool. And working so hard for it and going over there and just getting beat up year after year after year and questioning like, you know, why am I doing this? Am I ever going to? you know, get better. And then to continue to do all the hard work and to finally have it click was really cool. That's awesome, man. Who has been your biggest competition along the way? And maybe take us through a race where you kind of went head to head, maybe the tactics that were involved. Man, well, when you race as long as I have, you have lots of <laughs> competitors. I feel like I made it through a few generations of riders that I would, you know, kind of battle with. When I started, I caught the tail end of the pioneers of the sport. I was able to do some races with, you know, the legends that really started the sport. I wasn't battling with them. They were way up front, but we lined up together and we would hang out together after. But I would say for the majority of my career, I had some pretty good battles with JHK, Adam Craig, Jeremiah Bishop, and that was kind of the, the bulk of my, you know, I'd say the first half of my career, I would battle with those guys quite a bit. And then later on, I started racing with like a Howard Grotz. We had some good battles together, Keegan Swenson. And then in cyclocross, I had some great battles with Powers and Tim Johnson, Ryan Trebone, Barry Wicks, this like I don't know. I kind of, I feel lucky that I span such a long time period, but I'd say probably racing either JHK or Sam Schultz too. I had some good battles with him, but for whatever reason, it seemed like when I was in the kind of mid beginning, mid part of my career, it seemed like I was always racing with JHK. It, he would always beat me too. We'd race and I'd be, pretty close, but seven or eight times out of 10, he's going to come out ahead of me or maybe more. And then we had a race in Puerto Rico one year. I think it was maybe 2004. I don't know. I can't remember when, but anyway, it was an early season race and I would always train a bunch in the winter. I'd go to Arizona and train a bunch. And we came out in that race and I, I think I beat him in that race. And so that kind of kickstarted my season and I felt like after that race, it's not that I would beat him all the time, but I would feel like I would have a, a more 50-50 chance of beating him rather than I needed to have a good day and he needed to have an off day. And we raced each other a lot at uh, the national champs. And he, you know, at the time when we were really battling together, I think I beat him one or two national champs and he, he maybe beat me like, I don't know, four or five, but I, I had kind of started to come on a little bit later. And then, like I said, I went on to have plenty of battles with, with Howard and Keegan and just Adam Craig during that time too was a great rider. He was more of a, an East coast style. He was really good at the world cups and the more technical, shorter, punchier stuff. But a lot of times our national championships, they'd be in Colorado or California. And it's just those kind of long, high altitude climbs that JHK was really good at. I'd say we probably, I probably had the most battles with, with him. You're right with the spanning of the career. You've, you've touched on a lot of different generations there. I mean, Keegan, <laughs> totally. 
Keegan's racing right now, and he's one of the best. So, yeah, amazing <laughs> season he's had. Yeah. During your career, did you ever incorporate strength training? Yeah, almost throughout my whole career. Now it's very common for people to strength train, especially cross country. When I first started, because the climbs were so long, it was more the when you watch the Tour de France or something, you see road guys that are super skinny, almost emaciated upper bodies, no extra muscle. But now the mountain bike courses are much shorter. The climbs are much shorter, more explosive. Cyclocross is more explosive, flatter. And even road cycling, the guys do a lot of weight training now. So I had always weight trained and with with the different disciplines. Cyclocross, there's some running. So I'd incorporate some running in. Weight training, I lifted a lot of weights in high school before I got into mountain biking. So I've always incorporated weight training and it's amazing because now it's like everybody does it. So it's just like part of your routine nowadays. But in the in the beginning, people, you know, they, they weren't as in tune with the weight training as they are now. I think that goes for almost all sports too. You know, back in the day, I don't think anyone was lifting for any sports. And then I don't know, maybe in the late 80s, 90s, I think people started realizing that it was beneficial and I think maybe it grew from there. I could be wrong, but it just seemed like it was around that time. Yeah. It seems like all sports have become more scientific with their training and everything is more measured and calculated and uh, you see the performances and the, everything continues to get better. And I think it's with all these, you know, the, the focus on all the little things. Yep. Do you have anything that you use specifically to help you recover after races or hard workouts? Any kind of supplements or devices, exercises like yoga, massage, or compression? All of those. Nowadays, not so much because I still race for fun. Now I just try to sneak in enough time on the bike to be able to do the race. I don't have a lot of extra time for the recovery stuff. But when I was racing, we would, you know, massage was always big, ice baths whether that's sitting in a tub full of ice or here in Colorado for a majority of the year, the rivers are pretty cold. So if you can bear to sit in the river for five or 10 minutes, that's always beneficial. I've had a a chiropractor that I've gone to for a long time. He actually came with us to our training camp before the Athens Olympics. So a lot of chiropractic compression, the, the squeezy legs or Norma techs. Those were always part of my protocol when I was racing, making sure to get some liquid kind of protein carb recovery right after a ride and then try to eat within an hour after that. It's funny because when you're when you're doing it and it's your job, it's all just a normal part of your day or process. You know, it's like if it's like work, waking up and driving to work or whatever you do. But then when it's not your focus, it seems like it takes so much energy just to you, you slam in a ride at lunch and then you, you're trying to, you know, you don't have time to make a recovery drink or you get busy at the computer and two hours have gone by and you haven't eaten anything. If you can incorporate those little things into your routine, even as an amateur cyclist or just, you know, an enthusiast, it can really be a benefit. It just takes, it's kind of like making it part of your routine. And out of those, if people are limited on time, which one do you think is the most beneficial? Well, it depends what stuff you have going on. Like obviously if you have a bad back, getting in to see the chiropractor once a a week or month or whatever it is, is going to be more beneficial. But I think the easiest thing is the eating around the the ride. You know, if you if you know you're going to go for a ride and you make a, a recovery drink or whatever, even if you're drinking some chocolate milk or just some type of liquid calories that have some protein and carbs that you can slam right after that workout and then eating afterwards as well. I never stretched very much during my career, but now that I'm older and don't have as much time to dedicate to just riding and I sit in a chair for a lot of the day. I've had to start stretching a lot and I notice a big difference when I can stretch and do some core and I try to incorporate it into the first thing, get up early and just knock it out. It's not my favorite thing to do, but I feel like it makes a big difference. And so whatever your, your particular weakness is, 
if you can try to mitigate that and make it part of your routine. Cycling and for anything, it, it seems like you just need a lot of not even motivation, but just almost dedication. Like you might not want to go ride and do whatever workout you have, or you don't want to get up and stretch or do sit-ups or whatever it is. But if you can just get yourself to do it each day, if you're not going to see the benefit in a week or two weeks, or maybe you will, but you know, a year later, you're like, wow, you know, my, my back doesn't hurt anymore. Or, you know, my, I've been doing box jumps every day for a year. All of a sudden I can, you know, hang with my buddy at the start of the, the race or, or whatever it is. Yeah. So just putting in that consistent time, it doesn't happen overnight, but the consistency I think is, is big for the recovery as well as the training. A little willpower, the consistency equals small positive things every day add up to a, a change in the future. So I, I agree with that. Yeah. If you think back, and and this may be a dead end question, <laughs> but if there was one race that you could do over, what race would that be, and what would you have done differently? That's funny. I get that question. I've had that question a few times. It's funny because I was thinking about it. My wife and I were talking about it maybe a month ago or something. And I always want to do over these races that were great races that I almost won or almost had this good result, but they were already great to begin with. So if I did them over, it probably wouldn't end up, you know, as good as it had. For instance, the 2012 Olympics in London, I ended up 10th. I had made it to sixth. I could like, was probably 20 seconds from the lead group for a medal in the middle of the race. I would have liked to have, you know, done that race over and made it to that lead group. But the fact that I was even there to be that close was more abnormal than normal. So I I would like to do them over if I could do do better, but I think I probably (laughs) got the most out of myself that I could have. Did you do anything pre-competition to get yourself ready or motivated, like music, any routines or rituals? Sure. You know, there's so many different types of races, but I had some of my best races, like the best chunk of my career when I had a a really good teammate and friend, Barry Stander, who he was South African. He was hit and killed by a car in South Africa back in January 2013. And, you know, having somebody there at these super stressful events when you're traveling, you're stuck in a little hotel room over in Europe where none of the TVs or none of you're not watching TV, the internet's spotty. You're just kind of sitting there, having someone there that is going through the same thing to talk to and just get ready for the events with and help kind of defer some of that stress or just bounce that stress was huge for me. But as far as a pre race routine, I would always have a, a similar breakfast towards the end of my career. I'd eat a lot of rice and eggs some Nutella. I'd usually eat it about three hours before the race, two and a half to three hours before. I would also, during that time, typically for our bigger World Cup events, they, we'd race at two or three in the afternoon. So I'd usually go for a morning spin for 30 or 40 minutes, eat some breakfast. We'd hang out and then I'd eat my pre-race meal about two or three hour, two and a half to three hours before. And then I usually get to the, to the trailer or truck about an hour before get my stuff together, start a warm up, maybe 40 to 50 minutes before for 30 minutes ish, listen to music during that time, drink some coffee or caffeine or something during that hour lead into the race for the cross country. I usually eat a gel right before the start. So I'd have all these little things that I would do, do tire pressure check. I was fortunate to always be on a a pretty pretty big team. So it always had great support at these bigger races where I had mechanics and, you know, pretty much everything I needed to do my best race. And so I'd, I wouldn't really have to worry about my equipment, but just making the final checks before the race and then pretty much go to the start line. When you decided to retire, was that a good decision? Was it bad? How did that go? And what made you just dis- decide to retire? I think it was a good decision. There were uh, multiple factors that played into that decision. Mountain biking had 
there were becoming less and less teams. So there are less and less jobs out there. I was getting older and I had transitioned away from the World Cup and was doing more of these kind of longer Leadville, LaRuda, the Epic Ride series races, kind of these longer mass participation domestic races. I already was kind of milking it as I was <laughs> stepping away. And then I also had a son. And so I was, he was a couple of years old. And so I was gone a lot for racing. And it'd be, it's, it was always hard to leave um, home to go away for these trips. And then it just became harder and harder with him being there and me missing him. So I stepped away. I had originally hoped to land a job in the industry and stay involved with cycling. It didn't really work out that way, but it's been great because I, I got a job in Durango. I'm a mortgage broker. And so I'm home every night. I can make my own schedule when I'm busy, like we've been crazy during COVID. I have to work a ton, but now things are slowing down. So I have more time to ride. And I think that because I'm not in the industry, it has, you know, a lot of times people go into the industry and they kind of burn out. They love, they love bikes, but then they do it for their job for all day, every day for years on end. And by the end, they don't even ride their bike anymore or they're less excited about it. But for me, I still get to ride my bike all the time and I still get to go out and do some races. I did the Leadville 100 this year. We have a lot of local races around Durango, great group rides, some amazing athletes. So cycling's nice because at least mountain biking, you step away from it and you can still participate and do it and jump in some races. I'm not gonna jump in a World Cup race, but I can jump in you know, a big domestic race and because we have so many good riders and here in Durango to help push ourselves, I can, you know, I'm not going to win the race, but I'm, I might be able to participate with some of the front of the race for a portion of the time and have that, you know, excitement and feeling. I think I'm, I'm pretty fortunate to have that. So I think it was good, good time to step away. Although with the gravel scene, I wish, I feel like if I could have held on for another year or two, I may have been able to milk it for a couple more years because those, those longer races towards the end of my career, I always, well, I always trained a lot. That was, I probably did more volume than a lot of guys for cross country and these longer events I seem to, to do pretty well at towards the end of my career. Based on what you said there, I think you made the right choice. I agree you know, with the timing. Even though you're retired, you're still doing it. So why do you love the sport so much and what keeps you doing it? I don't know why I keep doing it. I thought when I retired, I would not ride my bike anymore or maybe ride a little bit. But for one, I, I miss it. I, I did it for 20 plus years and you have formed this community. You travel all over together. You see these people. And then when you retire... You don't see them anymore. It's not like you you work some job in your town with your twenty coworkers and you see them at the grocery store and picnics or kids soccer games, whatever it is. These people are kind of spread out all over the country, the world. So being able to stay connected to that community because I don't work in the industry, I think is a motivation to ride and stay fit. And then again, here in Durango we have Fort Lewis College, which they have an amazing cycling program they're always up there to win the national champs they don't always win it but they've won it 20 or there's road mountain track BMX. there's so many championships but they have won tons of them so every year we have a fresh batch of college kids that are super motivated that come to town we have a great group ride where we have guys like riley amos who's out there he's he's won u23 world cups he's an up-and-coming rider with trek we have the Simmons brothers who are, you know, racing the tour and on the Yumbo development team, we have Chris Blevins who, when he's in town, will come on the rides. And then we still have, I've been chasing Ned over and on the, that ride since I arrived in town in 1995. And I still am chasing him around, for instance, on Tuesday, this past Tuesday. So, I mean, he is like mid sixties probably. And, He's one of the fastest guys in town still. 
And every year we get a, a fresh batch of, you know, however many college kids. And so it's just kind of, I don't know, it's normal here. So it's just kind of the normal thing to do. And I guess that keeps me mot- motivated. I also feel fortunate to have been a professional cyclist for such a long time. that I feel like I've been almost gifted this pretty good health and fitness pretty deep into life or whatever it is. So I don't want to just throw that away. And my son is really into cycling and I want to be able to beat up on him as long as possible since he doesn't (laughs) listen to me with anything else. (laughs) (laughs) That's funny. (laughs) In Colorado, the whole state, what is your favorite trail system to ride? I'd have to say the Colorado trail. The Colorado Trail goes from Denver to Durango. It's about 300 and something miles. And it starts at or finishes in Durango. So the section of trail here in Durango is pretty awesome. And we have some different trails to access that trail. So you can make some nice loops out of it. But Durango is a a semi-arid kind of high desert. And you go one direction, you're in scrub brush and it's sandy type of dirt and open and then you hit the Colorado Trail and it goes up into the forest and you're in aspens and it's pretty dense and but it's it's a really nice section of trail and it's probably it's been around forever we have a lot of new trails like everywhere else you know cycling has mountain biking has taken off over the years and so there's more trails specifically built for mountain bikes Uh, that Colorado Trail has been around for quite a while and it's still my favorite so it sounds like it's got a variety Definitely. If you were to give advice to younger athletes that look up to you, what would that advice be? I would say to just, you know, if, if you're passionate about something, if it's cycling or whatever it is, and you want to try to make a career of it, then I would say you should go for it. Because it's funny, for the last 20 or however many years, it didn't feel like I was really working. You know, it was my job. I had to perform. And it was stressful, but most of that stress I put on myself and the experiences, the places I got to go, the people I got to meet, it's been amazing. You know, I I probably would have just been, I went to school, I worked at IBM for a little bit. It was a great job. There were people there that were really passionate about what they were doing. But for me, it just, it was a job and cycling, it, it wasn't a job. It was what I loved to do. And so, you know, whether it's cycling or maybe you love computers or whatever it is, if, if you're, you're passionate about it, you're probably pretty good at it. And if you go all in, likely it will work out for you. I like that. Is there a book, maybe a YouTuber or an athlete or a coach to follow that you would recommend for a young rider to maybe help get more out of what they're doing? I don't know about a good book or YouTuber or coach. I mean, there are some amazing coaches out there now. And the cool thing about cycling is usually it's a pretty tight knit community. So if you're into cycling and you want to get some advice or get better at it, usually whether you're at your local cycling club or your NICA team, which is a, a whole nother thing that is amazing. Now we have NICA usually the kids that want to, you know, find that extra help or, you know, get additional information. It's, it's usually pretty available. I feel like if you have a little motivation to find it these days, there's a lot of resources out there. I think you're right with NICA and here in Michigan, we have MISCA, which is basically the same thing. If you just ask around, even ask your coaches, they're going to know someone that can help guide you. Exactly. Is there anything else you'd like to say before we sign off? I think we pretty much covered it. Yeah, I appreciate you having me on. And it's always great to talk about the good old days. And, you know, what a great sport we're we're all into. I agree. Where can people find you on the Internet if they want to connect with you? I'm on Instagram and Twitter. I think my name is Yoti Wells on Instagram and Twitter. And I used to have a blog and all sorts of stuff, but that's all kind of fallen away. You can find me there. And if you send me a message or have a question, I always get back to people and happy to happy to help any way I can. Absolutely. So find them on Instagram or Twitter. And I think you were right with your handle. 
<laughs> yep. Yo T Wells, right? Yo T Wells. Well, Todd, I appreciate all that you've done for the sport of mountain biking. I enjoyed keeping tabs on you with your success and even towing the line with you at Iceman, even though you destroyed me. <laughs> <laughs> I wish the best for you in the future, and I appreciate you taking the time to come on today to reminisce on your career. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's been fun. You have just listened to Unpacking the Athlete.